phrase that I've been drawn to lately is that we are immortal individuals. We've been given immortal principles. Now to apply them to life-changing situation becomes the real challenge. Elder Neil Maxwell, an apostle of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, thank you for having this conversation with us. Thank you, Hugh. I'm glad to be with you. We're going to talk a lot about values today, and I wanted to begin by perhaps referencing a line from the movie Chariots of Fire, uh, which many in our audience will remember. The young would-be Olympic sprinter goes to the coach, and he says, I want to have you make me fast. And the coach says, we can't put in what God left out. When we're going to talk about character, I want to ask at the beginning, does it really matter because can you really put in what wasn't there to begin with? I think you can enhance it. And I believe that while a person might start off with one gift or virtue, others could be given if they're meek enough. So I guess I would say it's mostly enhancement, but I believe there can be some uh, acquisition of, of virtues that may not be there to begin with or that were so minuscule they scarcely register on any kind of radar scope. People don't like the word meekness. They consider it's not it to popular. be effeminate or perhaps uh, wimpy. It's an antique virtue. Yes. What is it? Meekness would be seeing ourselves in relationship to God, but also I think seeing ourselves in relationship to what we have the power to become and being humble enough to work away at those possibilities. So meekness isn't a milk toast thing at all. It's, I believe, a, a, a realistic appraisal of where we are, but also being honest enough to see where we have the power to go in terms of our personal development. And that meekness then gives us, uh, I think, more intellectual honesty than if we're, as you said earlier, prideful, or if we regard meekness as a virtue that because it's unpopular, we don't need to spend any time at. When we talk about values, people are immediately going to be ready to ask the glass house question. Who's going to be talking about values? Because we're all imperfect people. And in fact, I think one of your great lines in one of your writings is, let us have integrity and not write checks with our tongues that our conduct cannot catch. It's tough to talk about virtue without appearing to be perhaps prideful. Thank you for that, because I feel it's immodest in a way for me even to, uh, to venture into this interview. But if I can be seen as somebody who, uh, by a process of, of life, has been able to move from here to here, Maybe I should be here, but at least I have moved. And in that sense, uh, my story can be everybody's story who's serious about values. And of course, in my case, Hugh, they are connected, as you would expect with my calling, with Jesus, whom I regard as the embodiment of, of perfection, whether it's with love or patience or meekness or submissiveness. To model after him can take us from wherever we are and move to a much higher level, even though the journey is long and mine is far from through. There is that tendency when we look up at people, whether it's a Martin Luther King, uh, a hero. Mother Teresa. Or, exactly. Mm. To say that those are special people. They must have had a halo from the cradle forward. Is that how it works? I think incremental improvement is the order of the day. They may start off with an initial endowment of character, but it needs to be enhanced, and that's what the experiences of life can be made to do if we will let them. But it takes meekness. In the case of Mother Teresa, she had that meekness and became even better, good as she was when she started out. And that, I see, is part of the gospel of hope, that it is there for everybody and incremental improvement can occur. And there has to be a constant model. That's why situational ethics uh, just can't cut it. They, they're too shifting. Another phrase from your writings is called the conversational corrective, yes. I believe, which means oh, to yes, rebuke yes. when rebuke is necessary, which is well part of honesty. I don't do as well at that as I should. I, I'm learning in the latter part of life to do that more, and uh, I don't know that I've done that or do it as well as I should, and one wouldn't want to become a pest with it. But there are times in conversations where uh, I saw in a group once it was not an unclean joke, but it was a joke at someone's expense back at some VIP workshop in Florida. Everybody laughed except one man who said, I didn't think that was very funny because it hurt so and so. I can remember laughing at that joke and, and then admiring this man's integrity for not laughing. Those correctives can often be given gently. I should do it more. 
but they're part, again, as you said a moment ago, Hugh, they're part of the integrity of our relationships. And the, that great virtue of integrity springs out of love. It's interesting to me that the, the primary virtues of love give birth then to integrity or loving kindness or whatever the virtue is, and then there are all the tactical applications. You wouldn't bear false witness against somebody because of your integrity, but you have integrity because you have love. And all these trace back to vice, though, and to the seven deadly sins, and just to get a comment or two on each of them, because it's good to remember what they are, so you know what they're they, very real. What uh, what about sloth? Much of a problem in 1998. Well, part of the challenge we have is that in our comparatively well-off society, a lot of people don't really have to uh, to work very hard, and laziness can almost become a kind of demonstrative lifestyle. You know, Veblen's conspicuous consumption probably has a a variation in which there can be conspicuous inactivity on the part of people and a, a lassitude uh, about life that uh, means even if they're not doing anything wrong, they are depriving other people of the warmth and the love and what they could do for them. So there's a deprivation they cause because of sloth that's in addition to what it's doing to them. The correction for sloth? I guess I believe... Uh, in the gospel of work and the law of the harvest and that too many people are insulated from the law of the harvest and therefore don't have to be accountable for. Explain the law of the harvest. Law of the harvest is we get what we plant and nurture and, uh, and not uh, something we haven't in a sense contributed to. And we are in a society in which some people can get away with sloth. What do you advise the parent who is perhaps concerned about that in a child? Well, uh, it's more than giving them child things to do or chores to do. It has to be a, uh, one in which the eloquence of example is there, in which dad and mom are really showing what, what work means. It probably means uh, more effort to talk a little bit about work than we sometimes do. Uh, can't just run around hospitals, but I think for people afflicted with sloth, it would be great to see the uh, nurses and doctors working on into the night, which I've had a special chance to see recently. Some of the times they are so tired, but they're there in the middle of the night doing their chores, and they have to be so precise, and you think, my, what dedication. I wish people afflicted with sloth could, could watch that sometimes and what it takes, but again, it's grounded in love. Anger. Uh, we hear about anger problems, and we kind of treat it as, a, as a, um, an illness now, but in fact it can just be ill-tempered. Uh, your words on anger. Oh, I, I worry about me because I still murmur at times. Uh, uh, murmuring being a milder form of anger where we're put off by some tactical circumstance. Uh, and uh, murmuring, it seems to me, uh, is unbecoming to those of us who are serious about our, our discipleship and you know, murmuring over the, the missed traffic light or the lack of a parking place or murmuring over someone not getting adequate recognition. All of those, it seems to me, though milder forms of anger, we ought to be able, better than I do at times, to take in stride some of the discombobulating circumstances of life that are tactical, not strategic, and be a little bit more at peace. We live in the most eroticized culture ever in history. Pornography is the internet away or a cable station away. It's everywhere. It's in the music. It's in the television. So lust, as one of the seven deadly sins, is perhaps the most excusable but also the most prevalent. Yes. What do you think about that? I know you've said fidelity, uh, chastity before marriage, fidelity afterwards, but how do you really get that across to young people today? They might just think that's kind of crazy. I think we're in real trouble. And if, if you were to ask uh, the adversary what his workhorse way of, of uh, destroying people is, I think is perhaps most common um, weapon is lust and immorality. And when he wants to inflict damage, he can turn to that. Not too many people rob banks, but lust is so powerful. And the, it is the negation of true love because it it's, thinks in terms of pleasing oneself and it is a very selfish, narrow, narrow thing and I believe we're in deep trouble uh, and one of the reasons for that is simply that we have First Amendment protections which are in place. I'm glad they're there but um, people of Sodom and Gomorrah 
uh, may have had absolute freedom of speech, but they didn't have anything worth saying. The witty friend of mine said that the adversary tore down the Berlin Wall because he was doing better on our side via yeah. lust. What, what is the antidote? I mean, we have, within that context... In fact, I said if the Gulag Archipelago just becomes a strung out Sodom and Gomorrah, where are we? Huh. I, I don't know how we can do it except we think in terms of absolute values, one of which has to do with the Seventh Commandment and in which parents teach by example and by explanation how powerfully important that is. But the culture set against us, it's, it's coming uh, full tilt against us. I am not optimistic about where that one's going to end up. Do you see much gluttony in 1998? <laughs> I do. <laughs> do you? Well, I do in the sense that while we're, uh, I was reflecting as we were at dinner the other night with some friends, I don't remember ever going out to dinner with my folks. We couldn't afford it. Now we, you know, we go through the list of what wonderful restaurants there are locally, and I like to please my palate along with everybody else. Uh, I don't see that as a major problem in the sense that lust is or uh, uh, so on. But yes, I think that once again, we, uh, we mustn't confuse that brief uh, uh, culinary pleasure with anything that's very lasting. C.S. Lewis had the screw tape say, cards will do. It will yes, eventually. that's right. That's uh, exactly right. Envy. That's a real problem, and I think it has to do not only with what happens when materialism is cut loose from religious values, but envy also as to status, or people who envy uh, what seems to them to be somebody else's lack of problems when they might be in the throes of big problems themselves. You've been in the church uh, organization for so long, always rising. Did you ever want the, the next calling? Did you ever desire to move up? And is that envy or is that just ambition well thought through? Well, I, I can remember once uh, many years ago thinking I would be called to a position. We didn't live in Salt Lake then and I wasn't. I thought that was a good experience for me to go through. It was not a big thing with me, but there was an expectation. And friends sometimes seed these expectations innocently by saying, well, I think that, you know, this will be what will happen to you, etc. It's good for one, as I said earlier, to have disappointments, even if one isn't craving or questing in any inordinate way. Uh, I don't... Uh, I have a phrase I use, to be uncalled in the church doesn't mean that one is unworthy or unable, just uncalled. And it's nice for us sometimes to be uncalled. Now let me ask you about the reverse of generosity, which is greed, but the 90s term which you used is materialism. Yes. And that's everywhere. What do you make of it? How do you control it? Need it be controlled? I'm not uh, uh, very sanguine about that one either because we we measure things in terms of our acquisitiveness and our possessions. The antidote, I think, would be uh, quiet community service. Uh, my wonderful wife does that at hospitals and so on, and that keeps things in a sense of proportion when we see people who have deprivation. Uh, it is also the case that if we are actually giving either money or goods uh, to people who need it, that is a good antidote. It's best, I think, if we don't institutionalize all of this, if we can do some of it privately, in which the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing. I hear people in the audience saying to themselves, well, I'm not a believer in much of anything. Does that mean I can't be virtuous? What do you say? No, I think people can be possessed of virtues, even if agnostic. I've said in my public talks that uh, some of those whom I've known who are agnostic are very decent, honorable people, possessed of virtues of integrity and so on. Uh, and uh, therefore, the answer to your question is yes, people have those virtues even if they may not be religious. If, however, those virtues have meaning and value, and they do, then it's the enhancement of those virtues that a religious commitment would hasten, and it is likewise uh, to move in the direction of uh, eradicating the sins of omission and that, I think, comes from religious commitment more than perhaps anything. Now, counsel children who may be watching about their parents. I would hope that children would be uh, free to raise the questions and concerns they've got and not be too shy. Parents get so busy, including my having done so. They've got to be willing to risk a little bit and bring forward their concerns. And then I would say to them in their personal prayers, 
pour your heart out. Heavenly Father knows what you're going to ask and say anyway. Don't hold back as if he doesn't know. If they can build that relationship with him of openness and with their parents, then I think all will be well. A, a phrase that I've been drawn to lately is that we are immortal individuals. We've been given immortal principles. Now to apply them to life-changing situation becomes the real challenge. To help children know that they really are immortal and these values are immortal, then let them handle those tactical situations uh, in a situation of openness with their own parents and with, with Heavenly Father. And then they'll live in the words of Scripture after the manner of happiness. Who is your closest friend? I mean, outside my wife and family? Yes. <clears throat> You know, I have a, a dozen of them that seem to me to be about the same, rich relationships, the kind where if we were separated for 10 years and came back, we could resume the conversation where we left it off. Or we think in ways that, uh, frankly, if we had no communication and a hard question were put to each of us, I know exactly what they would do. So it's familiarity, it's an instinctive congeniality that is there and it does not depend upon frequency of association for the intensity of the friendship. A rare thing isn't it to have that many good friends? I feel so blessed a and it's an open-ended thing. In, into my life have come several dozen people with cancer in recent months. They're wonderful people and it's just an open ongoing process which uh, is just absolutely delightful. Now physically I cannot tend the friendship network the way I'd like to. I worry sometimes that I neglect someone or I'll get up after an evening prayer and I think, my goodness, uh, I prayed for eight people but I forgot two others. But there's an ongoingness to it and as I said a moment ago, the, the marvel is the intensity of friendship doesn't depend upon the frequency of association. You can pick up these friendships after slack periods. What's the relationship between virtue and character and friendship? Virtue for me consists of the attributes that form character, like love and forgiveness and, and patience and so on. Those are the attributes and virtues that form character. Friendship ought to be able to be extended to people who may not have those virtues or they're being partially developed. But I'd have to say that I resonate most to those whose character is more fully formed than mine and therefore I admire them and want to be with them and to be like them. Laughter plays an enormous part in good friendships and I think in the cultivation of yes. humor and in virtue, but if it's the right kind. Is good humor, do you, do you see it always following along with good character? I do, uh, but it's, as you say, a different kind. It's often self-effacing <clears throat> or it's the humor of people who notice life's incongruities uh, but not at somebody else's expense. I think the humor that is biting or sarcastic, sometimes witty, is barbed at times and is perhaps uh, not full of loving kindness. But the incongruities of life, uh, the uh, uh, self-effacing humor, I think that has a place in lubricating human relationships and it is a wonderful thing uh, uh, to see. My own view is that the people who have the greatest sense of humor in that sense are those who are less concerned with themselves and that frees them to see the incongruities of life and the inconsistencies of self upon which they can comment. Uh, a person caught up with himself and doesn't see those things and uh, uh, is not very humorous. Regrets after as many years as you've had, uh, there have got to be a few. What are they? What were they based in? They would be based in my failure to be as good a person as I should have been, to have reached out to people I might have helped, to have not given the garment of praise to people who were shivering uh, with it. Those, those failures dot the landscape of life. I hope they're less frequent now than in times past. But I don't have any sense of career failures or things I would rather have done. I, uh, there are paths I could have chosen, but uh, I don't, I don't have those kind of regrets. You thought of politics once. I did. I thought of the U.S. Senate in particular, and there was a time in the 60s when there was fire in my belly, but uh, fortunately the fire went out. Uh, but I did think of that, and uh, regarded the U.S. Senate as an institution of 
considerable significance. So that, uh, yes, but that, that faded in terms of not the importance of the U.S. Senate, but what I was to do with my life. Sophocles has uh, had wrote a long time ago that you cannot judge how good the day has been until the evening comes. You're in the evening of your mm. life now. How has the day been? It's been a wonderful day. The way in which things are intertwined, the boy from Salt Lake who goes in the New York City division or goes to Eastern Canada and beginning to see the goodness of people, the intertwining of all my experiences, being on KUED many years ago and interviewing people, having half an hour conversations such as we're having now, and seeing how good people are, whether it was a Hubert Humphrey or a William O. Douglas or somebody local. People, I like people, and I like to listen to them, and I learn from them, and all of life's experiences have helped me to see how profound that second great commandment is about loving our neighbor. I don't know how one would do that in isolation. There have to be the clinical experiences. And of course, the first great commandment, uh, which is preeminent. So it has been a good day, however much longer it lasts. Now, that's what I want to turn to, because we talk not long after you came close to not just being in the evening, but being at the end of exactly. the day. And I'll let you explain to the audience how, what kind of illness you've just come through and how serious it was. Well, it was leukemia not long after you and I did the broadcast and after the first chemo, 46 days in the hospital. Uh, I have not suffered the way other people who've had cancer have suffered and I'm now blessed to have a lot of new friends in what I call the cancer network. But it was leukemia and uh, at age 71, uh, uh, obviously a, a stressful experience. But I would have to look back on my life and say, you know, Paul said the, the afflictions that are common to mankind. I really haven't uh, uh, had anything that extraordinary. Now, I'm going to have to interrupt you there because uh, it is to me extraordinary to go through cancer treatment and to, and to go through chemo, uh, how many times? Three times. Three times. And to do the bone marrow extraction. All and we know that, yes. It's painful and it's not easy and it distresses, if nothing else, your children and your grandchildren and your close loved ones. So it's an mm. awful and a hard thing that I don't want to... Uh, pass over lightly. All right. What does it mean to you? Are you different now than you were two years ago? Oh, I think so in this sense that there's a depth to learning. For instance, when Jesus said uh, of himself and his great, very great agonies, ours are so minuscule, he said, I would that I might not partake of the bitter cup and shrink. That has come to have meaning to me in that in the process of what little suffering I had, not shrinking was more important than surviving. What's so, that mean, not shrinking? Not, not to recoil, not to retreat, not to give up, not to panic, but to be steady and uh, imperfect as I'm sure I was. I believe I was blessed not to shrink and that was emulative in a small, small way of what he did. So there's a depth to my understanding there. I believe it also is a time of deep reflection so that I would think uh, quite specifically in terms of what I needed to do, uh, perhaps to be more kind to someone or to draw someone out, or I needed to attend to this. I even had a little list of things to do. And uh, so the reflection in the midst of suffering is very useful. And suffering's the sweat that goes with working out one's salvation, and a little perspiration doesn't hurt. I did say, however, when you pass through a fiery furnace, you don't run out and line up in front of another one and ask for a, a, an extra turn. I'm not doing that. There's a very good likelihood that that answer has just been watched by someone, perhaps even in the very ward where you were treated. What do you say to them who are suffering now, if not with leukemia, with some other cancer, right. some other debilitating disease, to encourage them? I try to talk directly with them about the status of their faith and whether... Uh, they're willing to let go if that's what it is. And uh, there are two sides to the why me question. Uh, uh, why me in terms of affliction, but the other side is why me in terms of remission. That is not easy to talk to somebody who isn't getting a remission. Mm -hmm. And I must have done that 30 or 40 times since then. But I believe there's an authenticity to the communication with people like that that can be helpful to them. Uh, you know, we, we forget that there's another question. Um, uh, why not me? 
place. Why should any of us be immunized uh, from the trials of life so that before we answer why me, we ought to say why not me? Let's pause on that word authenticity as well because it's a very important word that's overlooked a lot when we come to talking about values. Yes. How do you judge what is authentic? You mean uh, that's happened to us or whether somebody else has Someone had, else coming. I think uh, experience in the spirit. I know that the, the use of the word spirit may uh, not be one that some viewers would understand. I believe the Lord can tell us through his spirit uh, if people are being honest and authentic and give us what we call the gift of discernment. I don't mean in every instance, but you can tell quite quickly whether someone... Uh, uh, is authentic in terms of how they're handling it. So that the wonderful woman who lives in the west part of this valley, of all, oh, I guess, hundreds of letters, the one most poignant was from a single mother of five children, which would be a challenge enough, who had her second brain tumor at the time she wrote me, and a boy 14 with leukemia. Now, the marvelous thing, is that I could see in the letter and in subsequent phone conversations no self-pity. There is an authenticity to that woman. She is of good cheer when there's not a lot to cheer about in contemporary terms. That is so authentic that I just feel inspired by it. And people who like her, who inspire other people, have an authenticity about them that is usually underplayed not very dramatized, but it's there, and you can sense it, and it's marvelous. How is she doing? Last conversation, okay. Uh, she has a son on a mission. She is, uh, uh, she works hard to provide for these five children. But the very fact that she would reach out to me was wonderful. I try to do some of that, but she has it special. What is it that allows your heart to be broken this much and still to keep going forward? Because this because is really about one of the ultimate virtues, compassion. Yeah, I think, what is the scriptural phrase? that The Lord gives us a new heart. Our heart has to be broken in a way so that it can be remade. By that I mean more spiritual sensitivity, more empathy, and more uh, capacity to... Uh, to be responsive to people. Uh, the natural man doesn't have a very good heart. It's pretty self-centered and hard. Uh, if we can put off the natural man, we can be given a new heart, and it will be enlarged. The scriptural phrase is that we can be enlarged without hypocrisy. And the whole process is one of trying to squeeze out of us the, the hypocrisy that's there. And I believe sometimes adversity is a, is a good squeezer. After you were sick, you lost all your hair. I did. You appeared before a great gathering of the church, and I thought that that was a, a unique moment because you didn't stop. You weren't vain. Was that, a, was that a problem for you? No, it was. I just felt I needed to make a statement, and my special audience within an audience were all the people who'd lost their hair because of chemos, and I wanted them to see that shining pate and, and feel a sense of hope. So it was deliberately done, and I wasn't sure in my weakness if I could make it to the pulpit or back, and I only spoke for six minutes, but that the, the shiny bald head was a deliberate statement of hope to them. And you'd be amazed and pleased at the marvelous letters that came in from people who felt uh, they weren't alone. I'm not quite certain how the pace of your hospitalization went. Was it a series of peaks oh, and valleys? 46 days for the first chemo and recovery. And at, uh, is there a period in that time when fortitude comes in where you say, I've just got to get over the next hill, or is it complete fatalism as to what will be, will be, and I'm in the No God's fatalism hands? at all, uh, uh, whatsoever. Uh, rather wondering what could I use the time uh, to do? Uh, what encouraging words could I say to people that came to see me? or? To, to praise those wonderful nurses and those wonderful doctors. Uh, how could I use that setting to do some good that wasn't just focused on me? I can remember saying to my oncologist, uh, uh, what wonderful doctors he and the others were to me. And, and it pleased me greatly when he said, well, 
you have good doctors here in the hospital, but the nurses are the best in the world. There is a, a contagiousness that I think we, we leave untapped if, we're, if we don't venture a little bit in those ways. So I didn't have any sense of fatalism. I was interested to see how the outcome would be, and there were obviously times when you wait with keen interest to see what the blood test is going to show. Have you ever met a great leader who was not compassionate? No, I never have. Not in my terms of greatness. I, there are prestigious, highly visible people who don't have compassion here and there in human history, but I've never met a person who was great who did not, in fact, have compassion. Greatness for me is measured by the degree to which that individual has the capacity to love God and neighbor. How do you cultivate compassion? It's experience, and I believe it's helped greatly by knowing who our fellow human beings are. They're not just functions. They're real people. I regard them as brothers and sisters. I regard them as in an eternal relationship. Uh, we won't just encounter each other here. There is a world to come. So perspective frames who they are. Experience helps us to validate, as it did for me, whether on Okinawa or in a mission field. There are so many good people. And they reflect, I think, who they really are, namely the sons and daughters of God. I'd like to ask you, what is it about the, the guidance that you would give to church and to country? Assume for a moment that people who are running both are watching. What's the, the, the pearl of wisdom you'd like leaders of the country, leaders of your church, to hear from your experience? Well, I, I think they've, you know, we have a special affection for America. We regard it as a choice nation. And I hope America will yet reach its destiny. We can't do it except the attention given to spiritual things becomes uh, greater than it is now. Uh, the First Amendment freedoms, the Constitution, in a sense, assume a moral people. And I worry about where we may be headed in terms of not everybody. There are so many wonderful, decent, righteous people. But I worry that there is a, uh, a cutting edge of of people who who would take us elsewhere in terms of lifestyle and and not regarding sin as bad and uh, I went to war for a country that had moral capital in the bank with something to spare in World War II. I don't know what the bank account would show now. I want it to be there for the sake of my grandchildren. So to be able to love America I think requires us to love the values that have made us what we are, and for parents to be able to teach them to the rising generation matters very much. And uh, I guess what each of us can do is within our circle of influence uh, do the best we can. But uh, uh, the intertwinings of our lives with those values uh, are just absolutely crucial for this country. I do not know where people will go to look for hope, the virtue you rightly cited a little while ago, if America falters. I hope America will not falter, but I am deeply concerned unless we can reconnect with spiritual things uh, in the values of our individual lives and our families, so many good people. But uh, I don't know what the bank account would show today. One of my favorite essays by C.S. Lewis is The Weight of Glory. You quoted in a recent talk that you gave to literally tens of thousands of students, wherein you say, do not be confused, you have never met a mere mortal. Yes. What's that mean, and what's its importance to you? The importance is that we're sons and daughters of God, and we are immortals. We will live beyond the veil of death. <clears throat> Individual personalities will be perpetuated. <clears throat> and that frames life differently, because people are not simply transients in a transient lobby uh, we see each other briefly and fleetingly, and then we're gone. But in fact, we're brothers and sisters, and, and we'll be together in the world to come. And one of my favorite sayings <clears throat> is that our friendships in this life are not merely friendships of initiation. They're friendships of resumption. And that's why we use the phrase kindred spirits or instant friends, that we bond with each other when... Uh, there is no history of mortal association. It's because we're immortals, and that frames human relationships in a totally different way. 
it likewise means that knowing who each of us is means that uh, the immortality that comes from Christ's atonement makes me want to become more like him. And my clinical material consists of other people. They're my chance.